to be back and um, thank you all for joining us tonight. As Kieran mentioned, my name is Zori Booser um, and recently I moved to New York. I'm director of research at the Girling Institute and also a research assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at NYU. And as Kieran mentioned, I was a faculty in the at the Spine Center in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. So had a joint appointment in uh, neurosurgery. So very exciting to look at the spine care outcomes and predictive analytics. And while today we will be really focusing on the surgical elements, I think the predictive analytics and AI hold really huge potential uh, when we think about regenerative spine and also non-surgical treatments. And I think it, I really, uh, it's grateful that a lot of our attendees are in a non-surgical uh, space. These are my disclosures, really. Um, there are no conflicts of interest for today's presentation. And these are the disclosures outside of submitted work. So when we think about the AI in healthcare, obviously, and all of us read that in the newspaper, it's very catchy. Um, there is a tremendous potential in changing medical care, and it's been uh, actively used uh, in oncology and radiology. And um, a lot of progress has been made, especially in the breast cancer diagnosis. When it comes to spine, uh, there have been around 300 uh, studies that have looked at AI, and it's often a mix of AI and predictive analytics, depending on the wording. Um, also where the AI holds really a true potential is looking at the hospital care improvement and uh, utilization. Uh, some of the studies have shown that just from the administrative side, AI could eliminate up to 14% of healthcare expenditures that we uh, have annually. And also then comes to the data safety and patient satisfaction. Uh, a lot of big university centers are using various platforms to store the data, transmit the data. So from the IT perspective, AI can def and also how that data is uh, collected. So definitely AI uh, holds a huge potential from that side too. At the same time, while I see some chat, um, at the same time, while AI is heavily present in the medicine, and uh, just in general, we are still in early stages when it comes to healthcare. These are just some statistics for us to look at. What's been done and analyzed is that only um, in a couple of years ago, only less than 10% of the hospitals actually had operational AI system. And very often when the executives were asked what type of AI platforms uh, they were not able to comment in a great detail. So there is still a substantial lack of knowledge around AI solutions. And Thank very you. often those uh, solutions Thank are, Thank are cool. built um, externally. So then that limits how much that platform can be used within uh, that specific um, institute center. Um, and very often data doesn't transfer between different centers, which we've seen in the past. Uh, when uh, working on um, multi-center collaborations. So uh, when we think about um, spine and why AI uh, is important, we first have to look at what type of predictive analytics and AI exists out there. So here are the three most important pathways and sometimes they are interchangeably used, but there are large differences. And we will just quickly go over each of these. There are standard statistical models, and then really the AI, one of the machine learning supervised. And that's really a precision medicine that's been used a lot currently, where we look at the specific pathology or procedures, and we want to know if a patient who is undergoing, let's say, single level spondylolisthesis, if uh, that patient will have better outcomes and lower complication rates, with uh, decompression versus fusion with decompression. Then um, more complex type of AI are neural networks, which are really designed to help us determine if a patient is gonna develop a pathology. And then even the further uh, down uh, in the complexity, it's um, deep learning models that use in simple words, various layers 
uh, of data uh, to predict certain events. And deep learning has been used in oncology, um, as I mentioned initially in predicting if uh, certain lesions are benign or uh, not. So just a quick intro into those statistical models so that uh, as we go through some of the studies and examples, what's been done in spine, it's easier to understand and see the difference. So uh, statistical models that are used in predictive analytics are really multivariable regressions and uh, ROC curves. And what ROC really means is how predictive model is and how can it distinguish from true false values of a certain variable that we are hoping that it's a predictor of an outcome. And um, what's very important about the ROC curves is their sensitivity and specificity. And also this area, so the ROC curve is this blue squiggly line and is really the area under the curve. So very often, and I'll again, reflect the spine literature, we will see that ROC curve value is 0.6 and the study reports significant predictor of a certain outcome. However, what we know about the ROC curve values that are around five or even a six don't show really predictive values. Uh, the range for the ROC curve is between zero and one. And as it gets closer to one, that variable that we are looking at has a greater predictive potential. Ideally, we want it in a range between 0.9 and one. Machine learning and AI, those are computer algorithms um, that are le uh, create really learning patterns by studying data directly. That's why we need a large num uh, amount of data to for the machine learning to see the relationships in those data sets and then that the relationships that the algorithm learns can apply to new data set and what's really important to remember here is that when someone is building an ai um, algorithm it's important to have a set training so-called training set that it's very unique and different than from the actual set and that sometimes it's not done, which then um, AI can't really predict trends. And then there are different types of AI supervised and supervised and reinforced uh, learning algorithms. So why is it important in the spine really to circle back? This was a study uh, from 2020 and it was published in JAMA looking at how much we spend in the United States uh, based on a type of uh, healthcare provider and also based on the healthcare conditions. So what we can see here in this orange, it's the low back and neck pain. And we can what we can see is that uh, across public, private and out of pocket payments, uh, low back and neck pain are really, really one of the leading, uh, not only causes of the disability, but also our healthcare spending. And this was just the projection for 2016. So when we look at the what's been done in the spine field from a surgical perspective and where predictive analytics have been used. These are just some of the studies and I'm just listing some. Again, there is around 300 papers that have looked at various scores, length of stay, uh, the blood loss. Uh, then also they have looked at the uh, post-operative pain control. One of the most recent ones, uh, they have looked at the spinal deformities and operative time and how uh, what complications um, can be predicted then this is the AI and really using the deep learning. And I'm again, just gonna show you some of them. Again, just a couple of titles, uh, again, looking at various outcomes, uh, looking at also uh, uh, at opioid use. And one of the most recent one is actually looking to predict early onset adjacent segment disease following ACDF. So if we look at a few examples of what other groups have done and also what we have done in the past at USC, this is a study uh, from a Dutch center. Uh, they looked, uh, they used AI to predict patient reported outcomes after a single level discectomy. So what you can see, this was a prospective registry and they started at 4, 000, over 4,000 patients. And at the end, really the patients who had one year of uh, patient reported outcomes and also all of the demographics and other surgical variables that were included in the study were 422. So a very busy table, but I just wanna highlight 
the importance of big data and granular data. So what they did as a first step in their analysis, they ran univariate analysis and looked at actually three main uh, outcomes, leg pain, back pain, and functional disability. And for them uh, to be a successful uh, improvement in the outcome, the MCID had to be at least 30%. So that's what's showing here. They started with 422 patients. And then if you just look at the leg pain, MCID, the patients who achieved, uh, it was majority of them. And then they wanted to see which variables between demographics and disease specific were predictive of the improvement in those patient outcomes. And that's what these p-values here uh, in for each outcome uh, show. So they took that data and went a step further and then used, if you remember from the initial slides, they used the logistic regression and ROC curves. And then they also used the deep learning created an algorithm to see which if it's uh, AI or just statistical analysis, which one will better predict leg pain, back pain, and functional disability in one year post-op after discectomy. And so what we, just for the sake of time, if you look at that area under the curve, AUC, you can see that for leg pain, back pain, and also functional disability, deep learning always was closer to one. So it was 0.87 versus 0.78, and for back pain was much starker difference in 0.9 versus regression couldn't tell uh, regarding the back pain, and then functional disability was very similar. So the interesting thing, what they did the step ne next or the further, every spine patient is different. Our population is very heterogeneous, and we see that uh, particularly in regenerative settings. So what they did, they created five patients with very, and what they did, they changed variables from their demographics, uh, from their uh, spinal potential spinal pathology, uh, their preoperative uh, pain scores. And then they took those values for those five patients who were very different and then uh, looked at achieving that a clinically significant difference in leg, back, and functional uh, disability. So what you can see that after a, having those five different patients and using the deep learning algorithms, it really showed that the algorithm can could predict for leg pain, which is the first one here, well, uh, the, the improvement in MCID and uh, the pain score, but then for back pain, the algorithm wasn't, wasn't uh, predicting that improvement. So this just shows how important it is to really have large data sets and variabilities so that all those changes in that every patient is different as we think about personalized medicine, we really need large data sets for machine learning algorithms to train and to have enough information to provide us with useful predictions. This is one of the studies uh, done within our uh, USC that we've done it uh, within our USC uh, Spine Center. This was looking again at predictive analytics uh, using statistical modeling, uh, looking at the effect of modifiable risk factors for uh, complications after lumbar spine fusion. Uh, we use national readmission database. Here are the years and the five uh, modifiable uh, risk factors that were used, alcohol use, tobacco, malnutrition, dyslipidemia, and hypertension. So, and here were the outcomes, discharge, complications, length of stay, and readmission, and our statistical uh, analysis. So uh, the study included uh, almost 300,000 lumbar fusion patients, and uh, we found that malnutrition, dyslipidemia, and primary hy hypertension uh, had significantly greater readmission rates than patients without those modifiable uh, risk uh, factors, and also dyslipidemia and alcohol use increased chance of complication. So when we did the predictive analytics and looked at 30, 90, and 180 days, uh, what we found was that as the, and this is a graph of predictive analytics for uh, 180 days post-op, six months, that every additional modifiable risk factor that was present was increasing chance of risk and risk of readmission by 2.44%. 
another similar study that we did, which um, just to kind of circle back, just shows that even with administrative data, there is a potential to look at some predictive uh, factors and with the modifiable, hopefully amend them prior to surgery and improve patient outcomes. This study done also within our uh, spine uh, center team was looking actually at spinal uh, metastatic tumors. And um, we looked at patients undergoing spine fusion within any uh, spinal region, and all regions were propensity matched, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and junctions. And the outcomes included mortality, length of stay, costs, complications, and non-routine discharges, again, the modeling. This is just to show you the study design. We started with around 35 uh, million, um, discharges and then for patients who received around 7,700 received uh, spinal fusion uh, for malignant neoplasms. And then there were three arms, propensity score matching that was then taken through predictive analytics to look at frailty and see if the frailty is a better predictor than usual comorbidity indexes that are used, in this case, Alex Hauser, and then how frailty can predict length of stay and mortality by spinal level. So what you see here is that ROC curve and uh, the different lines uh, show uh, frailty alone, which is a black line. Then we have Alex Hauser and frailty and Alex Hauser combined. If you remember from the beginning of our presentation, here are the AUC values area under the curve. And really the best predictor was when we used frailty combined with the comorbidity index to predict length of stay in patients with metastatic tumors. Very similar with mortality actually. Mort uh, frailty was not a good predictor of mortality in this population. The only one that uh, was uh, in acceptable condition was for the lumbar spine, which is the blue uh, line showing the area under the curve 0.75. So just to kind of give you a glimpse of the complexity when it comes to AI and uh, predictive analytics, this was really a computational model where they looked at the predict uh, analyzing and calculating surgical invasiveness, machine learning techniques. And what they did, they included, it was well-controlled study, very small population, and they uh, compared open T-lift to two MIS procedures, X-lift, and they had MIS A-lift. And they really wanted to see which variable, and very interesting, uh, if it's a, a surgery link, surgery, in uh, uh, either time or length of surgery or the, uh, the surgeon experience, or if it's biomarkers, blood biomarkers taken prior and after the surgery that can predict the invasiveness. And without really, it was very complex. They used a couple of different types of machine learning algorithms and statistics. They found that when the data that was provided from those 72 patients and created invasiveness score, the top one was the surgery time, but then when they did predictive part, it was really the biomarkers that were more telling about uh, invasiveness uh, prediction and also the outcomes and uh, chance of complications. This is just uh, that obviously, Predictive analytics and AI have been used also in spinal de deformity. This was from International Spine Study Group. And what they looked at, they were looking at open versus MIS surgery. Again, a little bit of a busy table where they compared two groups, looked at uh, what in univariate analysis, what were the predictors affecting the approach that it's used. And then when they went into their multivariate analysis, they found that really the age, older age, was favoring more the MIS approach, whereas um, uh, back pain, uh, decompression, TPA were more uh, favoring an open approach based on their regression analysis. So to really summarize, there is definitely a large number of studies in the spine literature focusing on predictive analytics and surgical outcomes. Um, but still what we need we we'll, uh, not necessarily lack, but to fully utilize AI, we need to define variables 
and that are predictive and that are easy to collect and standardize the collection across uh, different institutions. And it's really important to um, strictly define the, na the names of these variables that are uh, collected because sometimes for just one pathology, several, because there are different billing codes, several acronyms can be used and then identify uh, sensitive patient reported outcomes and really focus on variables that we know to be accurate and reproducible. So just really as a summary and an end slide, this is really the big picture where AI can help us in the spine. This was a recent systematic review in the Global Spine Journal by Malo and uh, co-workers uh, who explored the different types of AI, what's being done and how really AI integrates all the other advancements that we've seen in the uh, spine and orthopedics, such as wearable technology, virtual reality, robotic surgery, and um, other elements, uh, computational predictive modeling. So with that, um, I would like to thank you all for joining us tonight.